Hey guys, welcome back to the King of Glory and our Maranatha Global Bible Studies. This is session 21 in the King of Glory. And um, if this is your first time with us, welcome. If you've been tracking along with this series, uh, you know, we've been zipping along like a herd of turtles. Uh, we're not moving all that fast. We've sorted through some of the background uh, in, in Psalm 24, and then we got into some of the New Testament development of Jesus's his own view of his his kingship. We got into the, the the idea of how the lordship of Jesus predominates the New Testament writing and really a, a, a right theology in terms of our personal relationship to the Lord. And uh, of late, I I felt the just the prompting to dive into what's known as a series of royal psalms, uh, Psalms 93. I'm not sure if I'll go through 99 or 100. And we've been making our way through those psalms. I spent a couple of weeks in Psalm 95 because I so love that psalm. And uh, last week, Psalm 96. And this week, we're diving into Psalm 97. Psalm 97 is going to follow a similar theme to Psalm 96 in terms of the the rain. Last week, I think I titled the session, The Ultimate and Total Rain. And we're going to follow that, that same central theme this week. But actually, I'm going to dive specifically into some of the aspects of, of the Lord's reign, especially as we see it in, in Psalm 97. So let me, let me dive in here to Psalm 97. I'll read through it, maybe make a couple of comments, and then we'll, we'll make our way through. Um, so here we are, Psalm 97, the Lord reigns. There's that, um, uh, that repeated refrain that is in so many of these Royal Psalms in this series, <clears throat> the, the Lord reigns. So as a result, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. And then you see this whole idea here in the second verse and going forward of, of both the, um, the beauty, the joy, the power, also the, the seriousness of the coming king, uh, when particularly as as the Lord is is returning, as we'll get to in this in a bit, how this psalm describes, it's it's a serious serious day. Uh, clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him. This has always uh, been the case, um, but here, in this case, fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. There's real judgment uh, in his coming. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. Boy, I've been in, I grew up in Florida in an area of significant thunderstorms and violent electrical storms. And I know that the, the power that you feel in these storms is tremendous. And imagine a worldwide thunderstorm, uh, the Lord coming, thick clouds and his lightnings lighting up the world. <clears throat> and that indeed the earth would see this and tremble. Verse five, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boasts in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Again, I've been making this point the last several weeks. We should never bow down to something we make. We should only bow down to the one who makes us. Uh, verse 8, Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. Um, this is a powerful reminder of the promises of God being made first and foremost to his covenant people, Israel, and what it looks like when they are set back in, in the place of restoration full promise, that Zion hears and is glad. The daughters of Judah rejoicing is reminiscent of uh, this is this is customary when kings would return from war victorious that the women would come out and greet them and sing. You see this even in the the Exodus account when the Israelites make it across the sea. Miriam sings, or you see this being prophesied in Hosea two at a time when God will lure His bride back out in the wilderness and she'll sing as in the days of her youth, as in the days of of her escape from uh, being delivered from captivity in Egypt. And so verse nine, for you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. O you who love the Lord, hate evil. This is a powerful reminder to those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, that we're not just to, um, to 
be angry at the things in the world that we see as being as being sinful and evil, but we're supposed to actually have active, the opposite of love towards these things, to reject them in totality. He preserves the the, life, the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Verse 11, light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. So this is a powerful uh, psalm, a celebratory psalm about uh, really what it looks like, I think, to to sing into it and to celebrate the coming of the Lord. Again, reminding us, going all the way back to the very first message in Psalm 24 about uh, the King of Glory uh, being welcomed as he enters into his gates. The two psalms that came before this, 95 and 96, are songs of joy and thanksgiving as well. The people of God are, are depicted or seen in these psalms as being glad as they go to meet uh, the king on his return, we would say from our perspective, this is a, a beautiful foreshadowing of the return of Jesus. This is what it might look like for us to greet the Lord at his second advent uh, and to bring him back in glory in order for him to take his rightful spot on his throne in his kingdom. And so Psalm 97 is extremely fitting, appropriate language to describe the completion of that event. Um, the Lord reigns. Uh, the king, the Messiah, is on his throne, and now the words of Psalm chapter 2, verse 6 are fulfilled. I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. Um, and so that's a, you know, a basic overview of what this psalm's about, the central theme. What I want to do is, as I said, is bore into this idea, this repeated refrain of the, the Lord reigns, or in Hebrew, Yehovah Malak. Uh, it's a just two Hebrew words that are power-packed sentence, really, and it's a declaration. The Lord reigns. Uh, you you might say something like "God is King," um, but the the that second word "malak" is is a verb, and it's 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 expressing um, something significant about what this what God does. The Lord is ruling. He is reigning. It's and and uh hopefully I'll break this down here, but this is, I think, a bit of his, his character and nature more than just something that he happens to be doing. So let's let's uh, sort through several aspects of, of, of just this, this concept of the Lord reigning. First and foremost, I think it needs to be said, it should always be said that this is good news. This is the best news, that there is nothing better than a God who is totally and ultimately sovereign and powerful, who is also totally and ultimately good. Um, this is the foundation of the gospel. It's the foundation of good news or glad tidings that, that, that the Lord reigns, that God is on his throne. Uh, a friend of mine likes to say he's not bored, he's not worried, he's perfectly capable of orchestrating the events that lead to the end of the age. And so uh, these words, the Lord reigns, cannot be written without praise and without rejoicing and without singing and without blessing. And so it must be announced. It must be shouted as good news. I remember when I was a kid, it used to be uh, I common even, but certainly you'd see it in movies, uh, a kid on the street corner with, a, with, with the day's news in his hand, you know, shouting out something like, um, you know, get your newspaper, hear ye, hear ye, whatever, you know, uh, he was just announcing that there was news that you needed to know about. And this is essentially the the calling of this psalm, uh, let, the, let the whole earth be glad, let the whole earth rejoice. And, and to, uh, you know, to announce this good news, we would discredit the truth if we didn't announce it. It fills it's news that fills the whole world with joy. And so as a result, it calls on every everything that has breath to praise the Lord. It calls on every ear, on every tongue, on every heart to, to be glad and to rejoice and to praise God. Um, you know, it says, let the earth rejoice, let the, let the many coastlands, let the distant shores. It's like, let every inch, let every crevice of the earth be glad. It is as though the psalmist says, let nothing fear but hell and let nothing be anxious about this triumphant return of the Lord but devils. Um, and so, you know, we have to take note, though, that in this depiction of the return of the Lord, that the Lord's first sovereign act upon his return is judgment. And you see this is in verses 2 and 3 and uh, all the way through uh, verse 6 or so, 
Actually, he keeps going beyond there, most of this psalm. And there are just a ton of scriptures that I could point to to bear upon this event. I'll just point to a few and I'll read through them. Uh, first, just, you know, for example, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to those to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. Uh, also, Jude 1, or really just Jude is one chapter. So the verses 14 and 16 of, uh, of Jude. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. This is a picture of what it looks like as, as this, uh, this reigning king returns in first to, to wipe the slate clean and to, to exact justice with righteousness. Hey friends, I apologize for interrupting. I wanted to call your attention once again to the conference that we're sponsoring next summer, July 2023, in Dallas, Texas. It's going to be July 13th, 14th, and 15th. The name of the summit is the Maranatha End Time Summit. We're calling our friends and family from all over the world to gather together around the Word of God, around these themes of the return of Jesus, the last days, of how the church can rise to meet the great challenges that are now even upon us. Go to maranathasummit.com for more information, details, registration. Registration is now open. Thank you so much. God bless. And we do hope to see you there. Uh, Isaiah chapter 66, verses 15 and 16 is another picture. See, the Lord is coming with fire. And his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment on all people, and many uh, will be those slain by the Lord. Now, this is a very strong picture of um, the power and the, 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 the complete sense of justice that the Lord will carry with him upon his reigning return. Um, the character of these judgments is given throughout this psalm. Psalm 97, clouds and darkness circling his throne. Uh, righteous and mer righteousness and mercy dwell. A fire which burns up his enemies uh, all around him. Lightnings flashing you know, from, from coast to coast across the world. Earth trembling. The hills melting like wax at the presence of the Lord uh, as the Lord's presence consumes the whole earth. And... Um, you know, I don't have time to go into it now, but uh, I, I love um, in Peter's in Second Peter chapter three. He, Peter talks about these events in in detail as the future day of the Lord, and so uh, I want to just sort through some of the aspects again of this reign that I think really bear weight on us uh, here and now. So one thing to take note of is that this is written in, this must be understood in a present tense. The Lord does reign now. This is not to be overlooked, this present tense. We might not see it, feel it, or understand it at all times and in all ways. Certainly the world does not in its complete, in any complete way, or even in any partial way, recognize the reign of God, um, the, 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 the reign of Jesus, but it is the reality. And it is the song that we hear and see angels singing. The elders and saints in heaven sing it perpetually. And daily we hear it, hallelujah, hallelujah, the Lord reigns in Revelation 19, verse 6. And I think that's a, it's just a key thing to keep in mind. Again, he's not growing in maturity towards a day where he will reign. He reigns now, even though we don't fully realize it, he is ruling and reigning. And 
Uh, I'm reminded in this that, that he he does really reign, like capital R, all capital R E I G N S. He really is reigning, and I'm reminded of uh, an old uh, Misty Edwards song. I think it was called "People Get Ready," where she says, "He's not a baby in a manger anymore. He's not a broken man on a cross. He didn't stay in the grave, and he's not staying in heaven forever." So people get ready. Jesus is coming. Um, this is a this is a really good de uh, depiction of who he is now. Again, he is everything he will be upon his return. He is now, and I think it's a key way for us to understand the the lordship of Jesus that Psalm ninety seven is trying to prepare our hearts and minds for, um, and that's that predominantly, and I think rightfully, we have understood our relationship with uh, with Jesus through the lens of his first advent, where he came in grace. And so we, the Lord has served us, and he served us well, and we've mostly known him in that he came in the form of a servant. It's been the focus of the Lord as we look back upon, uh, you know, the Maranatha that he came. It, it's been the focus of the Lord to provide for us and to serve us and to give us the things that we've lacked and we needed to give us strength and wisdom and, uh, and and a solid ground under our feet and authority and power to live and to survive in this world uh, that we might live the best lives we could possibly live under his authority that we might have that we might know joy and happiness i mean this is the goodness of god and in this way god has been king as well, that he has been a servant king. But now um, we have to point our hearts and minds to the future, to the day of the Lord, as I mentioned earlier, that Peter talks about in 2 Peter 3, that we see throughout the pages of scripture, that we see depicted here in Psalm 97, that we see in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, where it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungod ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or in other words, he came once in grace, he's coming again in glory. First time grace, next time glory. There'll be no mistaking when he comes back. No one will wonder who this who this king of glory is. All will know. And this is what we see in verse 6 of Psalm 97 uh, here, where it says, The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. This is what it's pointing to. The, the, um, he'll, in that day, no longer be mostly known and marked by his servanthood. Think about Philippians 2, where he came in the form of a servant and was made lower, you know, became lower than men, took on the form of a servant and, and died the lowliest of deaths, went to the lowest of lows uh, to die on, on, not just the death on the cross, but but to, to drink the entire cup of God's wrath on our behalf. And he no longer is going to primarily serve in that role, but he's going to primarily reign Um He'll serve. He'll be a God who serves, but he will he will be marked and characterized by his by his his righteous reign over all creation, over everything, over the universe. He will take all power, all authority into his own hands because as a result of of his death on a cross and his defeating death, he's been raised up to the highest of highs where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. He'll no longer be lower than man, but above all. And you know, I think you would agree with me when I say it's time that he should do so. We we it, it, there's a fullness of time feeling. That, man, we really it, we we want you to come, Lord, and to rule and to reign in totality. It's reasonable that we that he should do so. We need him. The earth needs. We need his 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 righteous reign on this earth, and it's just. There is so much that is unjust in the world, that it is necessary for him to come and to reconcile and restore all things. Everything, we're ready. We're, the earth needs for everything to, to bow and stoop and submit to his law and rule and to his will. No person who has a proper understanding of the sovereignty of God should ever say, my way is the way it's going to be, because 
it's my will to have it my way. None of us as believers should ever say that. We should instead long for his will and long for his coming to make every wrong thing right. And the day is coming, beloved, make no mistake about it, where there won't be any heart or tongue or won't be a single unbowed knee that will in any way, shape, or form be able even to move against the authority of the Lord. Okay, next, um, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. This kingdom that he is now setting up uh, is an everlasting kingdom. And I, um, you know, it, it, this, it, it's hard for us, I think, to understand the, the significance of this because we only understand administration by the weakness of, of man, um, not by the power of God. And we have understood and seen systems, even in the best systems that have been ultimately marred by the folly, the, the foolishness of, of humankind. And, um, but God in his own, in his own kingdom, in his kingdom will manifest complete and total righteousness, his own compassion, his own love, his own peace. He will do all things that he desires to do by his, by himself. It doesn't require, uh, you know, all of the things that break down uh, human kingdoms and human governments, uh, pride and ambition and oppression, tyranny and, uh, and selfishness and greed, all the things that have marked the, the, you know, the government of man uh, will be wiped away and there will be pure righteousness and judgment and equity for all and, and infinite power and strength and holiness and goodness and all these things shall f are going to shine forth from the very face of God as we behold his glory when he returns. And, um, you know, I, it's just a, it's just an incredible thought to me. It's, it, it makes me just even pause and, and, and catch my breath. Um, that is, we, uh, people throughout history have always cried, you know, give us a, a, a a king that the Lord will eventually answer that in and of himself in, in totality. Um, it's also worth noting that this reign of his will include believers. Um, it shall not just be uh, a totalitarian kingdom with a king, uh, Lord Jesus, in the angelic realm, but his rulership will be in his saints. We see this in, in Daniel 7, verse 27, in the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Uh, as his kingdom uh, is administered in his glory, it's also going to have combined within it, and I think this gives me great hope and delight, that there, the sweetness and gentleness of, of humanity, um, brothers and sisters, friends and, and saints, you know, believers, the, 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 the church of, of the followers of Jesus, the, the subjects, the citizens of the kingdom who will serve the king, and um, God himself sitting on the throne, overseeing the government of the kingdom and administering his reign and doing it through his his saints uh, is just a very powerful vision for me. The kingdom and dominion under the whole earth shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Um, this uh, nature of ours, this body of ours, in, in its glorified state, in its uh, in its perfect righteous state, will reign with Christ upon the earth. That's just a beautiful thought. Um, however. We have to take account of the not yet part in that we look to the present evil fallen state of the world and we have to recognize when we talk about reigning and ruling that Satan is the prince of this world or the prince of the power of the air and he has his own present demonic mandates um, that, he, that he governs by and it's worth noting we are not to fear him but to respect his... Um, the way in which he governs. And I'll tell you, there's some points to that that are worth noting. And then I'm going to read a long quote. I have a few long quotes to cut to finish by here. And um, I don't know if I have all of them sourced, but if I don't, I'll figure that out. Um, but here's a few notes about the, 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 I guess, the demonic mandates. One, 
he has made your captivity and your misery the focus of his rule. So what he thinks about night and day is, how is it that I can keep these ones who are made in the image of God and designed for freedom and designed for adoption under, um, you know, and, and, and to inherit all that is Christ's? How can I keep them in, out of that freedom and in captivity? And how can I keep them out of a, uh, a place of peace and in a place of misery? Uh, two, he he keeps us busy chasing our sins. This is his great work is to keep us mostly fixed on those sinful desires and satisfying them. And I'm talking about both the big besetting sins, the ones that you would never mention. Maybe you mention them to the, you know, to, to the closest of your friends and, and, and by the grace of God that you would confess them, you know, to the Lord. But, you know, you would feel shame to see these, you know, portrayed up on some sort of movie screen. But I'm also talking about the little foxes in the vineyards that he keeps us chasing, that he's just as satisfied to keep us um, fixated on the, on on even the little foxes in the vineyard. In this psalm, I love that it it, it says, and I'm trying to figure out again which verse it is. Um, verse 10, let those who love the Lord hate evil. <laughs> it's the agenda of Satan to keep us busy chasing the things that God says we should hate. And so there is a measuring line in that. And, you know, the enemy says, be angry. And we are marked so way too many of us as being full of rage. He is said, be greedy. And we've been full of greed. He said, be dark. And we've been full of blindness. He said, be proud. And we've been full of haughtiness. And that yoke has to be broken. Here's a quote, I believe, from, from Charles Spurgeon that I think ties so beautifully into the truth and the power of this, this uh, psalm and of this declaration that the Lord reigns. The sting of Satan's whips is in your conscience. I know. Your errors and mistakes have been come through the kingdom of darkness in you that you do not know God or his holy hill. You would come into the enjoyment of God, but Satan will not let you. You would know God, but Satan will not suffer you to know him. You would be wise into salvation. He will not permit you. He has fettered you with his chains of darkness. He has captivated your judgments. He has made you to grind at his mill and to drudge in his service and has made you to cry out, Oh, when will the Lord come? But now his wicked reign is at an end. What you had, you shall want. And what you want, you shall have. What has been shall not be. That which shall be must be and cannot choose but be. You shall have love because the law of God is love. And you shall have peace because the kingdom of God is peace. And you shall have light because the inheritance is marvelous light. You shall have righteousness because this state is true holiness. You shall have liberty, settledness, stability, and every good thing in the kingdom of God. It's always ill with us while Satan reigns. It's always well with us while God reigns. When our husband is king, we shall have preferment and honor and riches and greatness and power and authority because our God reigns. Hey folks, thanks for watching the Maranatha Global Bible Studies. We pray that these resources encourage you. It has been a value to us from the beginning of FAI to produce quality media to resource the global body and give it away for free. Free and free forever. Now that said, if you want to join us in reaching those who do not have the gospel, we invite you to jump in on our $5 a month giving campaign. Literally skip a coffee and you can change the face of the Middle East in the 1040 window. Head to FAIstudios.org where you can give safely and securely. Maranatha. Now, um, here's a quote from a guy named William Sedgwick who is commenting on uh, some aspects of this psalm. And he wrote this in like the 1640s you know, or something like that. I love quotes from long ago. I think they're, the classics are usually the best. Here's what he says. The Lord does reign and says, I am upon my throne. I am great. None is great but myself. I am king. I have the scepter in my hand. I am powerful. No one is powerful like I am powerful. All the power of men is broken. All the thrones of men are shattered into dust. All the wisdom of men is turned into folly. And all the strength of men is melted into weakness and water. 
the melting and decaying away of the powers and dignities of the world, speak it aloud. The Lord reigns. And then finally, this one goes all the way back to Augustine, and this is kind of how we'll close today's session. The Lord reigns. He who stood before the judge, he who received the blows, he who was scourged, he who was spit upon, he who was crowned with thorns, he who was struck with fists, he who hung upon the cross, he who as he hung upon the wood was mocked, he who died upon the cross, he who was pierced with the spear, he who was buried, himself arose from the dead. The Lord reigns. Let kingdoms rage as much as they can. What can they do to the King of kingdoms, the Lord of all kings, and the creator of all worlds? And so, Jesus, we acknowledge you as the, our reigning king. You are the, the God king, the one who reigns. And Lord, we, we, we have no concern for any raging, any lesser kingdom that would rage. We say, let them rage as much as they want. What can they do to the king of kingdoms and to the Lord of all kings? So we thank you, Father, uh, for your present reign. We thank you, Lord, for your future day where you will come in glory and uh, let all the earth rejoice. In Jesus' name, amen. Maranatha.